Good morning, everybody. My name is Dinesh Khanna. I'm a rheumatologist and direct the scleroderma program at University of Michigan. And it's a pleasure today to virtually talk about stem cell transplantation in people with scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. So, you know, I'm going to go over about 30 to 40 slides out here, and then hopefully we can have quite a bit of discussion in the remaining 20 minutes. Uh, you know, many of you in the audience and online suffer from scleroderma or you have family members who have systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And here are a few pictures or photographs of our patients that we see at University of Michigan. And you can see that scleroderma, as I've been listening to different talks, can have quite a bit of impact on people's daily life. And, you know, you can see on the upper panel, hopefully you can see my pointer, are people who have early scleroderma with skin thickening and hand dysfunction. Lower left panel, people who have limited cutaneous scleroderma with calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon. And the lower right panel, internal organ and musculoskeletal complications that are associated with it. There have been excellent presenters throughout the two days that have given you talks about Raynaud's and ILD, so I will not be discussing that as part of my presentation today. I want to start by saying, uh, stating that how do rheumatologists look at scleroderma and treat scleroderma in 2023? So if you come to University of Michigan, you tend to get certain medications that are there to, to kind of be supportive in nature, and they may be anti-inflammatory medication, low-dose steroids, maybe ACE inhibitors, uh, proton pump inhibitors for your heartburn. And on left are two people who have significant Raynaud phenomenon and digital ulcers. And for that, we give vasodilators such as Viagra or Sildenafil, calcium channel blockers. And then right are two people who have lung fibrosis and significant skin thickening for which we tend to give immunosuppressive therapies like mycophenolate, morphetil, cellcept, cytoxin, antifibrotic therapies such as nintedinib, and then offer stem cell transplantation. This is a busy slide, but I just wanted for the patients to know that, you know, how do centers in U.S. treat early scleroderma? So there are about 12 U.S. centers that are highlighted out here with 301 very early people with scleroderma with a disease duration of 1.2 years. And I think the bottom line of some of these is number one, that majority of us tend to use mycophenolate morphetil as first-line therapy for management of systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And many of you in the audience and online probably either are on mycophenolate morphetil or in the past have tried mycophenolate morphetil. Uh, it is followed by methotrexate in approximately 21% of the patients, and the use of cytoxin, deep penicillamine is quite low in the cohort or the treatment paradigm in people with scleroderma. I think if you look at any immunosuppressive therapy, we also call it immunomodulatory therapy uh, during the course of the observational cohort, almost 90% of the patients were on immunosuppressive therapy. You can also see the utilization of autologous stem cell transplantation is quite low. It was about 1.3% and the use of low-dose steroids. So we tend to put you on mycophenolate because there's some data from scleroderma lung study too, and there are other observational cohorts, including ours, that we believe that mycophenolate is a good treatment it is not FDA approved for management of scleroderma, and we have borrowed mycophenolate from the kidney and liver and heart transplant arena. Despite what we do out here, the outcomes remain unsatisfactory. So this is the same cohort that has been followed for the next 10 years at 12 scleroderma centers. Many of you may have participated in this cohort around the, around the United States. So the first part is showing the change or worsening of skin score or skin thickening. And you can see majority of the people with early diffuse scleroderma have worsening in the first one year, and then things tend to stabilize. 
In the middle panel are people who have lung fibrosis and worsening of forced vital capacity. And you can see that the proportion of people who continue to have worsening of their lung function by greater than 10% continue to accumulate over the next four to five years. And I think despite our trying our best with mycophenolate and other therapies, there is significant mortality associated due to progressive lung fibrosis or progressive scleroderma in approximately 15% of the patients over a period of next five to 10 years. So we are trying our best. We are putting you on immunosuppressive and immunomodulatory therapies, but despite that, the outcomes seem to be rather unsatisfactory. So here's an article, it's, a, it's for a medical journal that Dr. Keith Sullivan, who, who's really championed the SCOT protocol and I wrote, uh, improving outcomes, outcomes in scleroderma, recent progress of cell-based therapy. So I'm gonna spend the remaining talk talking about two, two three different kinds of stem cell therapies that we are testing or have tested in people with scleroderma and other autoimmune diseases. I think before we talk and we start, we need to understand what is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And then the figure on the left lower panel, you can see that hematopoietic stem cells come from your bone marrow and they are very pliable. In other words, you know, they can make into, into lymphocytes and T and B cells, which are your immune cells. It can make into red blood cells. It can make into platelets and other another important cells that we capture when we do a CBC. Now, why do we use hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in scleroderma? And it comes from positive observations in transplant registries and thought to work by eliminating your dysfunctional immune cells that we believe cause scleroderma and to reset or restore your immune system to normal function. So that is the thinking behind, that's a hypothesis behind why people are offered stem cell transplantation. And if I have to go over, you know, in a very basic manner, what happens is that if you are the right candidate for stem cell transplantation, and we'll talk about the benefits and the risk, you go through mobilization. In other words, we put in a line into your peripheral vein, and we collect the stem cells, we activate the bone marrow to, to bring the stem cells out in the peripheral circulation. We collect the stem cells, we treat the stem cells with something called CD34 panel, and then we ablate your immune system, we kill your immune system to remove the bad guys, the bad immune cells and the antigens, and we give back your stem cells that have been treated, and usually the stem cells are able to engraft or be in your system in next 10 to 14 days. And you know, those, those next two to three months can be, can be pretty rough, but most of the people really do well with supportive care. So there are four steps for any stem cell transplantation procedure if you're undergoing a SCOT protocol or any other protocol. There have been three large clinical trials that have been done comparing cyclophosphamide, which is a potent chemotherapy versus autologous stem cell transplantation. Now, what does autologous mean? That means we are taking your own stem cells and not asking a healthier, healthy volunteer to give you their stem cells. So the first one is called ASSIST. That was done by Dr. Richard Burt uh, at a single center at Northwestern. ASTIS, that was done in Europe and SCOT protocol that was led by Keith Sullivan at Duke uh, and was funded by NIH. And what you see out here is that, you know, they all compared it to high doses of cyclophosphamide, six months here, 12 months here, and 12 months here. So we're giving you quite a bit of cyclophosphamide on a monthly basis. And many of you uh, who have disease for 10 to 15 years had been exposed to cyclophosphamide, although we tend not to use it at Michigan Medicine, but but there may be centers who still use cyclophosphamide for management of systemic sclerosis. The only difference between these first two protocols and SCOT protocol is total body radiation that I will talk about, and they looked at outcomes of people over time. 
So this is a very, very important slide, and I, I would like to highlight some important aspects out here in this slide, and, and I'm just going to use a pen out here, which may be helpful. So you have to look at the outcomes from 1994 to 99 up to 2011 and 2015. The 100 day transplant related mortality, I told you the first two to three months are critical, have remarkably improved in people who have autoimmune diseases. It has gone from 6.4% to 1.3%. The three year transplant related again has decreased by more than 50% if you look at over the last 30 years or so. Now, the key thing that, that we will come back is the disease recurrence. If you total body radiation, there's one in three chances that scleroderma will come back, usually in a milder form, but scleroderma does tend to come back without total body radiation. And you can see, which is quite heartening to see, is that overall survival is above 90% when you look at from 2011 to 2015. So we are getting really good at doing the transplant, finding the right patients who may be, who may benefit from this life-saving therapy in people with early diffuse systemic sclerosis. So let me give you a perspective on total body radiation. There's quite a bit of uh, people are scared. People don't understand why do we do total body radiation when we do the SCOT protocol. I'll give you a historical perspective and then I will give you the rationale in SCOT protocol. So historical perspective comes from people who have leukemia. Leukemia is kind of a blood cancers or other cancers. We really try to eliminate cancer cells that are residing in the bone marrow you deplete the bone marrow to provide space for the new stem cells to come in. Now, most of the time when you have leukemia, you get allogeneic transplant, in other words, because your immune cells and there are genetic defects in there, you ask for your, your relatives, you know, usually your, um, your, your children or your siblings to provide you those stem cells so it can reside in the, in the depleted bone marrow. And of course, prevent rejection of donor cells through immunosuppressive effects. And the rationale in, in Scott was that there are dividing cells that are in the periphery, but there are many non-devising or resting cells that are antigens that cause scleroderma. And that is one of the big rationale that we see much less flare or relapse of disease in Scott protocol compared to patients who did not have Scott protocol deplete bone marrow to provide space, and also more, more importantly, decrease the dose of cyclophosphamide. So I don't want you to worry about all the, all the, you know, the dosing that we are giving, but, you know, we do shield heart and lungs, I'm sorry, heart, lungs, and kidneys during the stem cell transplantation. There are acute and chronic toxicities that we are worried about. You know, it is not a, radiation without any ill effect. And one of the most concerned is, of course, infertility in younger people who have scleroderma, pneumonitis, which is inflammation and lung fibrosis, which is prevented by shielding of the lungs. And some people may develop myelodysplastic syndrome where the bone marrows start to become more fibrotic because of the radiation that has happened. And that's why many centers around U.S. provide non-myeloablative transplants with no to little radiation. So another way to look at it, if you give, you know, low to very high, high, you know, radiation and chemotherapy, you are going to have a much robust, much more toxic effect on your blood lines. And with the myeloablative, you know, unless and until we give your stem cells back to you, your immune system is irreversible. It will not be able to recover back. So like I mentioned before, here's the data. This is a European bone marrow transplant registry. Uh, it is, it's a very large registry and you see three diseases listed out here, multiple sclerosis, scleroderma, and Crohn's disease. And what I want you to focus on is multiple sclerosis and scleroderma and a five-year relapse or a five-year flare of about, you know, 35 to 40 percent. Whereas when you look at the SCOT protocol, you know, if you go up to five years, 
the flare is about 20%. So risk of flare is about two to three times with non malleablative transplantation versus SCOT protocol. So more radiation, more toxicity, more likely to you will have relapse, but then there's more toxicity short term and long term that is associated with it. So where's the data for non myeloablative transplantation? We'll focus on the international European study called ASCHES, and it was a very interesting study where they looked at event-free survival. Event-free survival means that you did not have any bad outcomes in your heart, lung, kidneys, and, and, you, and you did survive over a period of seven years. And you see out here that early on in patients who had stem cell transplantation, they had a higher mortality. And at about two years, there was a reversal where people who had stem cell transplantation did much better compared to patients in blue who received cyclophosphamide or chemotherapy. So something to remember that there's a reversal that happened and which we have improved over time. You know, this study was done and published in 2014. The study recruited for approximately 10 years in early 2000. The, the impact and the improvement with the stem cell transplantation was remarkable. Patients who know their modified rodent skin score, I mean, an improvement of 20 point in modified rodent skin score and a hack DI of 0.6 means that you have no more disability left. In other words, your skin is soft, you're able to close your hands, you're able to do activities of daily living. And when you give chemotherapy, it has some effect, but nowhere close to what you see with stem cell transplantation and remarkable improvements in your lung function. And when it came to mortality or organ failure or death, like I stated, early on, there was transplant-related mortality and the two groups of people who really were affected by this were people who were smoking and people who had pulmonary hypertension. And I'm sure you have heard some discussion and talks on pulmonary hypertension at this meeting. So there were 10% of the people who died early on due to, due to procedure. Part of it is that they were still refining the procedures. Part of it is we didn't know which patient to select. And therefore, wherever you get stem cell transplantation, it is critical to work with rheumatology there that know which is the right patient because not every patient is the right patient to get stem cell transplantation. Over time, you see that five people died because of progression in the transplant group and 26 people died in the cytoxin. When I say control, these are people who have cyclophosphamide. And one of the side effects of giving a lot of cyclophosphamide is cancers. And you know, see four people who had cancers out here. So, so again, a much higher death overall when you follow the people for seven years, but a much earlier transplant related mortality that you see out here in the transplant group. So now let's go to the SCOT protocol. SCOT mm -hmm. protocol is what we do at Michigan Medicine. SCOT protocol, what is done at Duke and other centers around the country, where we compared uh, stem cell mobilization um, with the, you know, with the total body radiation and the myeloablative transplant versus cyclophosphamide. And again, we talked about total body radiation, and you can see the amount of cytoxin dose is much lower. It is about 9 grams here compared to about 16 grams in the group that got cyclophosphamide, so half the dose or almost half the dose of cyclophosphamide versus stem cell transplantation. Total body radiation we talked about or irradiation, highly immunosuppressive, kills non-cycling cells and makes space in your bone marrow for those stem cells to go in and reside and start to grow and make their home out there. So the people we included, and you know, this is quite a bit of question that I get from patients. People we included because it's a toxic, because there's morbidity and mortality transplantation, we want people with early disease. Most of us, although we try to relax, are diffuse scleroderma with early disease duration with either lung fibrosis or prior scleroderma renal crisis because we want to treat people who are active and irreversible disease and who have poor prognosis and predictable is important. 
In other words, we want to make sure that the benefits of this toxic therapy, but life-saving cure, curative therapy outweighs the risks that are associated with that. So that has been the focus, although centers like ours and Duke have been trying to expand this inclusion criteria, and we tend to transplant people with more progressive ILD, despite if they have disease duration of more than five years. So who are the people who are included? They tend to be younger, or in, at least in this trial, they, they were younger, 45 years with a disease duration. And this is critical, disease duration of two years. Everybody had lung involvement. And probably the most important part for the patients to understand and caregivers is that you have lung fibrosis, but lung fibrosis is not that severe. It is 74% of what it should be. Most of the people who are referred to Michigan Medicine have lung function of 30 or 40%, and that is too late to do stem cell transplantation. Those patients are more appropriate for lung transplantation. So you have to have healthy heart, you have to have healthy kidneys, healthy liver because of the toxicity that will be given to you. The body is able to, to recover from that. Otherwise, you know, there will be quite a bit of toxicity and, and death associated with that. So, so I just wanted to show you what, what are the patients that were included here versus cyclophosphamide arm. And, and you can see again, early disease duration, 95% of the patient had evidence of lung involvement. So the survival, the survival was remarkably better if you got stem cell transplantation versus if you got chemotherapy and event-free survival means that you survived, but you didn't have any bad heart, lung or kidney involvement. Now, this is a very interesting slide and, you know, I hope you can, you, you can look at it. The question that people ask is, so what improved? So we are going to focus on these two charts here, transplantation and cytoxin. Uh, there were, these are people who died in black. So there was much less death in the transplant compared to people in the cytoxin arm. This is event-free survival. There were much less, there were four people who did not meet who had cardiac heart or other organ involvement compared to much higher in the cytoxin arm. Now, the most important to me is the lung function here. You can see a, a more than half the patients out here had an improvement in the lung function by 10% or more. And I'll show you impressive CT findings from a patient who'd received this cytoxin, uh, stem cell transplantation compared to only four or five who had improvement, majority of the people in red had a significant decline in their lung function. And if you see here, most of those people actually died because of their, because of their decline in the lung function. So again, there's improvement in forced vital capacity, remarkable improvement in your skin. Everybody had complete resolution of skin fibrosis except for one or two people and a remarkable, remarkable improvement in the HAG DI which is a measure of function. And you can compare, and I really like this graph because you can compare and contrast, um, you know, what are the attributes of your skin, lung, and function that can be improved with the stem cell transplantation. So let's look at two patients. You know, the patient one is on cytoxin, uh, who was treated with 12 months and followed up. And what you see out here is that despite being on cytoxin, for 12 months and other therapies subsequent to that, the patients have progressive ILD. You know, the ILD out here, you can see this color coded. This is a computer artificial intelligence quantification. And you can see with your eyes that there's much more red and blue that you see over the period of time. Lower patient received stem cell transplantation and you can see quite a bit of lung fibrosis here, but almost a resolution of lung fibrosis at the end of 54 months, which was the primary outcome measure for the trial. So again, uh, it is not just stabilization. In a large minority of patients, there's almost or a complete resolution of lung fibrosis. What are the other things that improved? So you can look at any patients, you know, this is long-term follow-up of these patients up to 11 to 12 years. Uh, there were two cases of myelodysplastic syndrome early on, which is a bone marrow from being cellular, becoming more fibrotic. But you can see that the patients tend not to take a lot of immunosuppressive therapy. They maintain their weight. And there has hardly been, you know, 
organ failures compared to patients who received cyclophosphamide. So this is as striking a data as it can be for long-term outcome in people. Uh, and, and you know, more people were employed after transplant and more people had a normal performance. Uh, you know, this is really critical, which means that you are have no disability. You're back to doing activities of daily living. You are you are really self-sufficient. You can take care of yourself and, and you're employed. You can go back to work and you know live your normal life. Now, again, longer term, if you follow people for 12 years, I can show that the transplant population continues to do well compared to chemotherapy and then relapse. You know, we talked about relapse before, much lower, uh, you know, if you just pull it about 20% here. And this is somewhat scary that about 60 to 70% of the people who got chemotherapy, high dose chemotherapy on a monthly basis for 12 months tend to continue to have relapse. So it's very clear that resetting your immune system has quite a bit of beneficial effect. Now, SCOT protocol is toxic, so I don't want you to take from here that there's no toxicity, therefore the right patient for the right protocol is important. And you can see out here that most of the toxicity in the SCOT happens in the first 14 months. Uh, whereas what you see in the cytoxin arm is that it is equally divided over over you know 72 months so so the right patient uh, and and Keith Sullivan has worked very very hard when we started introduced thought protocols about eight ten years ago at Michigan you know there was quite a bit of fight but I'm pleased to tell you that I have not had anybody declined over the last five to six years uh, because it is accepted now by insurance and by the community as standard of care Okay, so let's move to allogeneic stem cell transplantation. You know, another thing to think about is that I told you about 30 to 35% risk of flare. Now, what if we transplant stem cells from healthy donors who do not have a genetic predisposition for scleroderma? So there are advantages of a cure, you know, and there's advantages that we are not giving you all the total body radiation because we are not trying to eradicate every bad guy that is residing in your bone marrow and other parts of the body. But there's always a risk of GVHT. And if people don't know what GVHT is, it's called graft versus host disease. Your immune cells are going to react unless or until you are an identical twin, your immune system will react to it, will try to reject those immune cells and people develop scleroderma-like disorder. Now, we were working with, with a company called Telaris where, the, where they have figured out how to have the donor and the recipient cell live in harmony. So there are ways to look at giving much lower radiation, uh, much lower toxicity, but have your immune cells and the donor immune cells live in harmony. So, so you know, there are some centers around the country who do this but most of us focus on autologous stem cell transplantation. Now, there are contraindications. The contraindication for stem cell transplantation, it's not a contraindication. It is really limited to relatively healthy individuals. So that's a, that's a problem. That's an issue that if we can only cherry pick people who have a healthy heart, healthy lungs, healthy liver function, and healthy cardiac function. So, you know, that makes it a little bit harder to cherry pick people who would be the right patients for this. And then of course you have the performance status here, active infection and psychiatric disorders. So it's for a very small subset of patients. You have to find the right patient at the right time for the treatment. I will move to, the, there's quite a bit of interest on CAR T therapy and I will spend some time on that. And then maybe we can stop after that and you know open it for question and answers. So immunotherapies are therapies that strengthen the power of a patient's immune system to attack tumors. You know, that's where the, uh, the discoveries happen. And immune system, you know, boosting drugs that have shown ability to shrink and even eradicate tumors in some people with advanced cancer. And in a small number of patients, these treatment responses can last for a year. So this is called CAR-T, which is for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. Uh, you know, T cells, as you may know, are one of the most important types of white blood cells for the immune system. And all the therapies that we give you immunosuppressively largely 
target the T cells. Now in cancer, if you have a cancer like lymphoma, and this has been tested in something called a B cell lymphoma where your T cells are taken from you and they are engineered within within a lab uh, and and you and you make your T cells active against a certain antigen or or the tumor cells and you and you inject millions of CAR T back into you so you can target the pathogenic antibodies or cancer cells for for that matter. Now I don't want you to think it is it is it is not kind of a stem cell transplantation. It requires lymphodepletion, so it's a non-myeloblative low dose uh, chemotherapy that is still required out here to make space for those T cells to go into the bone marrows and to do their job. But this is very exciting, and this has led to really important discoveries and cure for people with different kind of lymphomas. So another way to look at is this is your T cell out here and it has been bioengineered out here uh, using using you know different different um, different processes to to make it more active and you know target those those antigens or antibodies that you want to want to target. So there are six therapies that are already approved and you can see most of them are for B-cell lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and leukemia. And then there are two therapies that target certain antigens that are important in multiple myeloma. So again, for refractory people, um, pe people who are not responding to your traditional chemotherapy, CAR-T has taken the world of oncology by storm. So last year, Dr. Josh Shett Who's a, who's a rheumatologist along with his team, bone marrow transplant team in Germany, you know, published a paper in Nature Medicine, which is the top journal in medicine, where he looked at anti-CD19. So this is what they are targeting. This is an antigen they are targeting with CAR T in people, young people with the refractory lupus. And he showed remarkable improvement in patients, these patients with lupus, with the improvement in their signs, symptoms, and long-term excellent outcomes. And then he looked at patients who had myositis, inflammatory myopathy, which is inflammation of the muscles, which is an autoimmune disease. And again, a remarkable improvement in their symptoms, inflammation, and activities of daily living. And recently this year, he did a patient with scleroderma. So I'll walk with this. This was a letter. This is exactly what he captured. Uh, so what, what he's showing is that it takes about nine days for the cells in the body to show CAR T cells. And, you know, these are showing that, you know, you inject the CAR T here and it really impacts your B cells. It depletes your B cells from the body because it's targeting the B cells. And after about 100 days, the B cells are starting to populate in your immune system. Very interestingly, this is the only study that I have seen that the autoantibody, this patient had RNA polymerase 3, and it completely went away at six months from the blood. So the patient was antibody negative. This is a heart MRI of the patient. This is the inflammation, and you see remarkable improvement of inflammation. At six months, the inflammation at joints have improved and their activity index has remarkably improved, and also their skin score has remarkably improved. So this is another therapy that, that is available to the patients, and you know this is something that we are actively working on at, at Michigan Medicine, and I'm designing you know, trials right now to bring CAR-T, hopefully early next year, to people who have systemic sclerosis. The advantage of CAR-T again is it's less toxic therapy, so we could be able to potentially offer it to a larger number of patients who do not need to be relatively healthy, like what we talked about, the autologous stem cell transplantation. There are side effects like anything. You know, first one of them is cytokine storm because the body sees these engineered CAR-T and they have a storm with fever, low blood pressure. And tocilizumab, which I worked on getting approved for scleroderma ILD, there are neurological side effects and there could be some flares. So again, exciting time, very early on, it should be coming to the patients and people with scleroderma to US very, very soon. Um, 
I have a few slides on another kind of stem cell called mesenchymal stem cells that again are very pleiotropic, very pliable cells that can, you can get it from bone marrow, but also from adipose tissue. These are fat cells that are in your skin tissue. You know, you have the layer of skin, you have dermis, and then you have fat cells and they can, depending upon the environment, they can be become into a bone they can become into a cartilage, they can become into tendons, or they can become into fat cells. So if they're very pliable, it depends what you want these mesenchymal stem cells to do and when you want to do it. And I want to highlight one of the work that we have been leading is really focusing on people who have hand dysfunction due to scleroderma. And this is called adipose-derived regenerative cells, which is really doing a liposuction and taking the adipose-derived regenerative cells, which is about 5% of stem cells, and they're again very pliable, very pleiotropic, and have shown to be effective in a trial that we did, I'll show you, to improve the hand function by improving, softening the skin, improving with the digital ulcers and Raynaud's phenomenon. And the phenomenon is that you get liposuction, you you work and you separate the adipose cells from here, uh, you know, by, by different techniques, you, you make sure that, you know, that it is sterile, that you're not introducing an infection and you look at the, the proportion of stem cells and other cells in the adipose, and then you inject them in the fingers. And, and you know, here's a study that we published and there's a, another study that should be starting next year. It was delayed due to, due to the issues in the market and fundraising for the company. But this is looking at the hand function in people who have scleroderma and health assessment questionnaire. And here are patients who had, you know, early or late diffuse scleroderma. So I want to highlight this is applicable for early, late, any patient with hand dysfunction. And this is one of the most common symptoms that the patients come later in the disease and a remarkable improvement in the hand function, both in the hand function and activities of daily living. So again, there are opportunities for cell-based therapies. Uh, SCOT protocol has been utilized, incorporated at Michigan Medicine. You know, CAR-T trials are being designed and planned trial for adipose-derived regenerative cells for hand dysfunction in 2024. So with this, I will stop my presentation and see what kind of questions do we have out here. 